Charles Rennie Mackintosh. In a previous post I mentioned that Charles Rennie Mackintosh was born a year after Frank Lloyd Wright and a year before Edwin Lutyens. We have looked at the work of Wright and Lutyens and now it seems appropriate to look at the third member of this generation and his importance to the development of architecture as it entered the 20th century. Mackintosh was born in Glasgow in 1868. In 1889 he began work as a draftsman in the newly established Glasgow firm of Honeyman and Kepi. In the early 1890s Mackintosh met Margaret MacDonald at Glasgow School of Art. They would marry in 1900. Margaret was a talented designer and is now becoming recognised as playing a major part in Mackintosh's work. Mackintosh once wrote to her, remember you are half if not three quarters in all my architectural work. Before they were married she worked with her sister who would marry another Glasgow architect. They became known as the Four. The Glasgow School of Art. At the age of 28 Mackintosh won the competition to design a new building for the Glasgow School of Art. This was designed and built between 1897 and 1899. In Pioneers of Modern Design, Pevsner notes that not a single feature here is derived from period styles. It is simple, almost austere with its straight lines and bold fenestration. The exception to this is the ironwork, especially the metal stalks at the base of the upper windows. Their function was to support planks to be used for window cleaning, but their delicate curving stalks, topped with what was to become the famous rose motif, give us one of the few links between British architecture of the time and the Art Nouveau which had taken hold on the continent. This seems to reference Celtic art and suggests Margaret's role in their design, as this was a major influence on her work. Pevsner notes that our eyes have to pass through the balls and stalks before arriving at the solid stone front of the building. In much of the rest of Britain in 1900, when the modernist style was gaining traction in the rest of Europe, architecture reverted to neoclassicism for public buildings, while neo-Georgian and neo-colonial designs became popular for large houses. This can be seen clearly in Lutyen's work. So it is that Mackintosh is one of the few British architects who was innovating at the time and who had an influence on the modernist style. I will return to this point, but first I want to look at the second phase of work on the Glasgow School of Art, the library wing, completed in 1909. Here, delicate ornament like the ironwork on the front of the building, has gone and we now have a squareness and robustness which also seems to draw on traditional Scottish baronial architecture. And this is also evident in the next building I want to look at, Hill House in Helensborough. The Glasgow School of Art is considered by many to be Mackintosh's most important work. Time has not been kind to it. The building caught fire in 2014. A careful restoration project started in 2016, but before that could be completed the building caught fire again in 2018, again suffering extensive damage. Hill House Helensborough Hill House was built as a country retreat for the publisher Walter Blackie between 1902 and 1904. At once the steep gables, the round tower and the massive chimney stacks tell us that Mackintosh's Scottish heritage has been a major influence on the design of the exterior. It is an exterior now enclosed in a protective see-through box while the render, known as Harling in Scotland, is restored. Mackintosh used the then new Portland cement Harling but this proved to be less durable than the traditional lime harling and was found to be in a precarious condition in 2017. 
the design evolves from the inside out as pioneered by Pugin at the Grange and it is the interior which is so special about this house. Inside all is very angular with strong vertical elements also evident in the library at the Glasgow School of Art and sparsely furnished and yet it is broken up with the most exquisite decoration which one commentator described as dreamlike. Particularly fine is the gesso panel by Margaret MacDonald of The Sleeping Princess. It is tempting to see Mackintosh in the angularity and MacDonald in the lyricism of the decoration, but whatever the truth of that, they complement each other perfectly. Catherine Cranston's Tea Rooms, Glasgow in many respects Mackintosh's interiors were the source of his greatest influence and the last two works I want to look at are essentially all about their interiors and of course Margaret would have had a major input to these. Catherine Cranston ran a chain of tea rooms in Glasgow as an alternative to pubs and Mackintosh and Macdonald were involved in the design of several of these which brought their work to a wider audience. The first tea room in Buchanan Street of 1897-8 had been illustrated in the Studio magazine in 1897 and it may be as a result of this that Mackintosh and Macdonald were invited to exhibit at the 1900 exhibition of the Vienna Secession. Their work was a revelation to the Viennese. Pevsner argues that the long and graceful lines and slim figures of their designs for Cranston's tea room caused a dramatic change in style for Gustav Klimt which led to his world famous painting The Kiss. Cranston's tea room is no longer with us and we have to turn to the Willow tea rooms in Sockyhall Street, the only surviving of Catherine Cranston's tea rooms, and exhibits in the Kelvin Grove Gallery as surrogates. It was part of Mackintosh's philosophy that a house should be conceived in its totality. Here the angular chairs for which Mackintosh is also famous dominate. And who should be designing high back chairs at the same time? Frank Lloyd Wright. It is thought unlikely that the two influenced each other but Wright was probably slightly ahead of Mackintosh in designing in this style. 78 Derngate, Northampton. By the time of the First World War, Mackintosh had become disillusioned with architecture and took up watercolour painting. They moved to Walberswick in Suffolk in 1914, where he was arrested as a German spy. However, in 1916, Mackintosh accepted a commission from Wenman Bassett Loke, who had made his money from model trains to remodel the interior of the Georgian house he had bought in Northampton. The results are striking and somewhat unlike Mackintosh's previous work. In fact it is regarded as one of the finest examples of Art Deco in the country. Here the designs are still angular but they are unrelieved by the swirling decoration of earlier interiors. The colour combinations are strident. Bassett Loke was a prominent socialist and once had George Bernard Shaw to stay. His wife was worried that the decoration of the guest room would keep the great man awake, but he assured her that all would be, would be well as he made a habit of shutting his eyes when asleep. After the war, Bassett Loke wanted to build a new house. He considered asking Mackintosh, but found him too fussy in his later years and commissioned the German architect Peter Behrens instead. Mackintosh did no more architecture. They moved to France in 1923 but returned to London due to illness. Mackintosh died of cancer in 1928 at the age of 60. From a fairly small body of work, Mackintosh and Margaret MacDonald are probably the most influential of British designers for the modern movement at a time when British architecture was notable for its conservatism. <laughs>